Oh my gosh, I can't believe it, Joe. We're here again on our podcast, Barry Funkhauser and Joe. The Barry Funkhauser Show continues. Hey, Joe, what do you know? It's still cloudy outside. I, yeah, it makes me depressed, man. Yeah, but you can run like in the uh, in the um, clouds, right? It's better for runners like you that run, right? No, it, it depends. Um, sure, is it like, nice to sometimes run when it's overcast sure but man i like the sun you know i don't like it when it's like 90 degrees at 8 a.m and i have to wake up at 5 a.m to go run before it's like blisteringly hot but i prefer to run when it's sunny and and nice and do you remember do you recall the last wildlife you saw whilst running the the oh yeah, like um, something that crossed uh, your path, know. like a deer or P twenty whatever. I know P twenty two is. Oh, uh, I miss P twenty two. That was a good. They're P seventy eight. You know what? You know what? I actually because uh, in my courtyard here we have a lot of blooming flowers and jasmine. So uh, after my runs, I have to do the bee gauntlet to my house. The bee gauntlet. Run through, what is that? I have to run through all the bees. There's tons of bees in my courtyard right now. Well, what a perfect time. It's very apropos to ha- bring on a friend of the podcast, Kevin Bach. He is a wildlife biologist, a bird watcher, a beekeeper, and a booze maker. Welcome to the program, Kevin. Hi, welcome back, Kevin. All right. Ah, uh, Thank you for having me. Oh, good afternoon, hey, can, gentlemen. Can you help me with my bee issue? How, how am I supposed to avoid these bees who want to attack me because I, I smell of sweet, sweet sweat? After my well, runs, I, are you really getting attacked by bees? Like after oh, while you're bees running, or are they just love in me? Your yeah, no, they love me. Like I get home from my run and I'm like literally dripping in sweat, and I have to wa- I have to like run through my courtyard because yeah, they like want to come up and smell on me and get all up on me and stuff. And I'm like, look, I'm not Beyonce. Leave me alone. I don't need your hive here to like go. Um, but so yeah, like what do I what do I need to do? Just just run, well, just keep running. Well, let's do a little triage here and uh, determine what's going on. What what color clothing do you wear when you're running? I assume you're wearing some active wear. Very bright clothing, yes. Yellows it, uh, and oranges and stuff like that. Fluorescent. Okay. All right. If, if you're wearing like fluorescent yellows and bright colors that would be attractive to bees, that might be one thing right there. Well, man, but now, oh, so now I got to like be all drab and and run around and graze all day. Now that does not sound fun. I'm going to, I'm going to let the bees keep attacking me because I just like my bright clothing. (laughs) That or uh, I don't know what kind of deodorant you wear, but those are the two main things, color and smell. So if you wear like a nice perfumey or scented deodorant too, that might be it. Um, Or hey, man, that's what it is. Your hug. Yeah. No, you know what? It's that it's that women's secret that I wear because it's the only <laughs> deodorant strong enough oh. for a man. Joe, you got to stop smelling like a flower. That's your problem. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna stop. Okay, okay. But Kevin, <laughs> please tell us what you have been doing yeah, recently. Yeah, what? You're in Chatsworth right now. Are you on a job or something? Uh, yeah, I, I'm on a break right now, so I can do this. But yeah, I'm in Chatsworth today, um, working. As a contractor, they're doing a lot of, uh, like, fire prevention. You know, after this summer, like, we had an amazing rainy year here in Southern California, as everyone knows. And it's, like you were saying at the beginning, we still got this June gloom going on. But what happens to all this brand new green vegetation once we know it's inevitably going to get dry? Yeah. Um, You want to talk about fuel for fires. So, right now, a lot of, uh, like... Edison work, a lot of Caltrans work is for fire mitigation and prevention. They're doing vegetation trimming, um, particularly along roadsides and along power lines. So if any power lines fall or any malfunction, you know, or they're not at least having the trees touch the lines. Um, Right. You know, this is going to prevent a lot of fires, but it's a huge amount of work. We're talking like thousands of miles of power lines and they got to make sure that they're not hurting any of the wildlife um, when they're doing the trimming. So my job really is to go ahead, look for endangered plants and animals and anything that's protected, which it's migration season. All native birds are protected. 
And uh, yeah, I basically get paid to go bird watching at this time of year and, and uh, you know, look for uh, protected flowers. And, oh, uh, hey, is, is, is nesting season over for birds? No, you're in the middle of it right now. Uh, nesting okay. bird season is from the beginning of February to the last day of August. Oh, wow. I didn't know it was that long. So you got to be careful about ripping down trees and things that might have some uh, endangered or threatened bird species up in there, right? Yeah. I mean, it's it's amazing, too, because this kind of goes into history. Like, why why is it that every native bird, whether it's our local pigeons or all the way up to our eagles and our beautiful condors, all of them are protected in migration season. And the reason for that actually is a historical one that goes back about 100, if my math is right, 105 years to the um, actually the North American Bird Treaty. Um, do you guys know the story of the passenger pigeon? No, no dude. Tell, tell us, us all about awesome. it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, in the early days of America, the passenger pigeon – like was known to be such an abundant bird and people ate it um like they would shoot them down out of the sky and we're saying there would be such large flocks of these birds that it would black out the sun wow yeah so th they're saying there were likely billions of passenger pigeons and of course what we like to do just like we did with the buffalo was eat them, shoot them for sport. And it got so bad that um, by the early 20th century, they actually went extinct. And, oh. um, you know, this caused a cascade in our uh, environmental, like in, in the ecosystem, in the areas where they existed. And when you lose something that's supposed to be food for so many other animals, they're supposed to maintain insect populations, seed populations and transfer, like any animal has its place, um, it causes a serious disruption and that ripple effect, like I said, cascades through the ecosystem. And it was such a shock um, like to, to our country when we lost that bird. It was so characteristic of early America that when we wiped it out, like there was actually legislation that occurred. People reacted. They were unhappy about it. And there was actually like public outcry over this. Um, and there was actually legislation made to prevent that from ever happening again. So in 1918, the, the, uh, the, the North American Bird Treaty, actually, I think it also encompasses South America, too, um, pro protects all migratory native birds um, from any type of disturbance. So if there's a nesting bird, like even, you know, like by your doorway, uh, there's a lamp. Sometimes you get a bird nest that'll start there. Um, the moment there are eggs in that nest, like you can't touch it. It is a crime to harass wow. the mother bird or the chicks. That's nuts. I love it. I love it though, but that's crazy. And it also, I, I I'm reading it right now. Uh, it's intended to, in, uh, oh, wait, 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 where, where was it is, uh, oh yeah. It protects and prohibits the taking of migratory bird species without any prior authorization by the Department of Interior, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So it doesn't yeah. even need to be a bird or an animal that is on that list. If it's migrating and it's nesting, it's safe. Yeah. I mean, it's like I said, it's one of the most expansive pieces of legislation. And how long ago we actually passed that, it's really remarkable. Uh, that was a huge landmark moment for environmentalism and conservation. And we do the same thing for bees. <laughs> Actually, there's efforts. People are trying to do that. Um, you know, in California, we passed the the bees are fish law. Um, <laughs> if you've heard about oh that. Oh, my God. I hate this law, dude. Okay. <laughs> so before you talk about that, I just love your job, Kevin, where – you're you're the major bummer for everybody building out there. <laughs> oh, I've got a story about that too. Oh, it tell just, us please because recently. you're the guy that shows up to say stop work. You can't work cuz there's a gosh darn bird in your way. Tell, <laughs> tell us your recent story, Kevin. All right. I, I think it's okay for me to say a, a lot of this stuff is like usually wants to be kept within company. Um 
and I'm sure utility well, companies. Well, don't get in trouble. Just, yeah, just exactly. white label everything. Take out the names, white label. Yeah, yeah we're gonna we're gonna, not going to mention names, but uh, I can do general location. So in this case, this story started probably about, we'll say a month ago, um, along the Interstate 5, uh, kind of near to Home Pass, and there was a crew that I've been monitoring for the last couple months. Um, they... I've been just trying to kind of repair the roads and the power lines that run along Interstate 5. And these guys come in from the Midwest every week. They fly in like Sunday night and they work Monday to Friday. And sometimes they'll stay for the weekend, uh, maybe go to Disneyland. They tell me, oh, I, I went to Zumba Beach, you know, like Baywatch, all that. Like they're, they're sightseeing on their weekends off. But if not, they go home. Um and they got to leave their equipment, which they have like these huge drill rigs because uh, they're drilling uh, the holes for telephone poles and stuff. And some of these are 20, 30 feet deep underground. The legs go. So these these drill rigs, they're like giant mobile tractors with a drill rig that's sometimes two, two and a half stories tall. And this thing oh, wow. is unbelievably gigantic unbelievably expensive and they only got one of these right now and they went for two weeks they had a, a period where they stopped working and before they could continue working they just had this drill rig parked at one of the sites so in order for them to continue working when they return i have to do a sweep of the area and let them know hey it's all clear there's no you know, endangered plants that have popped up or there's no protected birds, or in this case, any birds, um, you know, that are in the vicinity. So everyone flies in from the weekend, they show up, and about an hour before they're supposed to start, uh, start work, I tell them I have, like, a huge, uh, under my arm, a huge number of signs, and I'm starting to uh, hammer these signs in all over the site, and they're like, uh-oh. What'd you find? And I'm like, I can't tell you. Um, you know, policy states that everything I call, uh, in, it, I mean, everything I find needs to be called a resource, quote. And I watch all these guys, they're like, oh no, like, can we go back to work? And I'm like, honestly, I need to figure out what's going on. In this case, I found just two finches, two little finches that started building a nest in the hydraulic arm of this oh, no. uh, drill rig. Oh, and no. I, <laughs> and I'm watching, and I'm like, oh, I think I don't think there's eggs in the nest yet, which if that's the case, I actually am qualified to be able to take that nest that isn't like an active nest yet, no eggs in it, and be able to remove it, and we can clear the space, and, and the birds won't be harmed. They'll, they can, within a day or two, build a new nest somewhere else. They'll be fine. But if there's eggs you know, that that's off limits. Yeah. So I don't, I can't look in there. It's like a two inch hole. And I'm like, ah, the bird keeps going in and out. I can't tell if there's eggs. It takes us hours. We finally go to AutoZone and get one of those little mechanic mirrors. And you know, that's on an extender. Yeah, get in the zone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We get one of those and I, I put the mirror in and I have the flashlight and I'm, I look and there's four eggs in the nest. Oh no. Oh, you're done. Yeah, and I, I walked over to them. And they're like, "So are we good?" And I'm like, "No." Mm -hmm. And the foreman, everyone is just like they shake their heads. They just got in, you know, from the Midwest off their flight the night before, and the foreman just takes a deep breath and says, "You know what? It's good there. It looks good there. That's a good parking spot. <laughs> let's go. To, let's go to the beach, guys." <laughs> how long? How long were you down? What were you down for? So they're shut down for five weeks. Oh, <laughs> so. oh man! How much money did that cost the company? Hey, well, it that, ser it serves them right. That's, that's man. the imagination. <laughs> it serves them right, though. They shouldn't be building in migratory bird territory, you know. But like everywhere, everywhere though, migratory. <laughs> Everywhere's migratory bird area. Oh. So I mean, it it goes to that extreme when you think about it. You got two dozen guys that are all on payroll. They're hourly, some are sal salary. They're going in for flights. You've got all the coordinating teams, administration, everybody, safety guys, traffic control. 
like how this one little finch nest causes like such an impact to major pro uh, projects. And it's like this, this power line, by the way, is like, this is one of the major power lines. This is one of the, like, you know, the hundred foot tall towers that carries power from like Bakersfield all the way down to Los Angeles. Nice. These are, these are huge power line projects with tons of money and Edison, you know, they actually do a good job. I mean, uh, uh, all, all opinions aside and everything, the fact that they have an environmental department and they take this stuff seriously and, you know, the regulations are followed and that's just kind of what it is. Those finches have a right to live and their kids have a right to live. <laughs> well, yeah, and they get in big trouble if they uh, break those rules, too, for sure. So let me yeah. ask you, Kevin, you've been a wildlife biologist for a number of years now. What recently have you seen in the wild that's been like, wow, I can't believe I saw that in the wild just now at this point? You know, I got to say right now, because of all the rains we've got, we have one of the most amazing super blooms in the Santa Monica Mountains down Mulholland. It is if, if anybody gets a chance, please go take like a nice, slow afternoon weekend drive up Mulholland. Avoid the bikers. But like the flowers up there, there's tons of mariposa lilies, um, which are a very rare endemic species so they only grow in southern california and like in these mountain ranges uh and and they're absolutely beautiful i mean you've got golden poppies up there and i i really can't just uh, stress enough that like as long as even since i was a kid i was hiking i was a naturalist i've never seen a year like this it's absolutely amazing it's so cool all these things are blooming super bloom yeah, um, I mean, Antelope Valley, I think it's still shut down, too. I think the... Uh, uh, yeah, because too many people were showing up and stepping yeah, all over the poppies. Yeah, we tried. We tried. We were going to go last yeah. weekend, but they were, they were well, like... Well, Joe, now you can go in. just off Mulholland Highway. don't come Highway. here. You know? You oh, can... oh, yeah. No, I mean, Mulholland's like right up the street from me. Yeah, I, you I, cruise I, up yeah, there. Just don't don't hit me while I'm running, though, please. Like, go do, do your drives. Just I'll be one of those runners out there on Mulholland, so just be careful. Uh, I I had to do that this morning from about 8 a.m. to eh, probably 30 minutes before I talked to you guys. I was surveying up Decker Canyon. Oh, um, really? Oh, that's a great place, man. Oh, I love it. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I, I'm a local, too, and that's one of the places you go with your best girl or your friends and you go for yeah. a drive. You know, it's, it's one of the best. But, man, I'll tell you, it was pretty scary walking up Decker. You know, I almost got, like, scraped off the side of the – cliff wall by some old lady in a yellow corvette this morning oh 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 let me let me at, at the hairpin right uh it was one of the hairpins uh before mall and once you're going into decker you know like from uh from the 101 it's I, as you're going I, uphill yeah, but i know it well Mulholland. yeah 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 man I, oh, you got to be careful like people come screaming around those hairpins and i'm like how are you doing this? How are you doing 50 around this hairpin? This thing's crazy. You're going to fly right off his road. I swear. Yeah, they don't care. They don't care at all. <laughs> all right. No, well, I'm like, man, I'm glad I don't know this lady. She seems like a very unhappy person. She drives unhappy. I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> well, Kevin, okay, so you know me. You know that I have been an amateur beekeeper for a couple of years. Thanks for letting me borrow this book that you used at school that is very thick that I've been trying to thumb through. But <laughs> can you tell us, because this baffles me, man. And Joe, I don't think you know anything about this, but they just recently changed the laws and the rules on beekeeping. And now they have classified bees with fish. And can you explain more on that there, Kevin? I think... <sighs> I, I don't know the complete ins and outs, and it's. I read the legislation when, when it was initially um, put through. But from what I understand, this is kind of a stopgap until we can create like a full section dedicated to bees. Now, I think it's the reason that they included it in that is because it's a law that protects our local invertebrates. And like a lot of our fish and a lot of our crustaceans and mollusks and stuff like that. And I, I think it'd be great if we actually pulled this up and checked it. But really the reason they did it was because it was the fastest way to be able to piggyback a protection um, for bees onto already pre-existing laws. And 
like I said, I think it's a stopgap right now until we can actually get further legislation passed. Since right now it's, I mean, it's it's pretty amazing how uh, important these are and scary how much we're losing them. The decline in them, I think like up in the foothills of the Sierra Nevadas, like Central Valley, where we have our agricultural centers, just due to all the activity from the farming up there and the honeybees that are there, we've lost, I think, about 50% of all of our bumblebees in that area. And, like, they're just disappearing entire species. We've got some endangered ones now, but legislation is just super slow on that front. It takes a lot of time and a lot of years, and we really don't have enough data. It's hard to collect data on very small creatures that are super fast and fly. Yeah, and there's so many species of them. So, okay, so are you for or against this uh, stopgap? Uh, I'm for it. I mean, honestly, anything that's going to be able to provide them protections, I think, is really important. I think, you know, the the scope of the protections is important. And uh, to know, like, okay, where are we going to go from here? How is this, you know, legislating something versus being able to act on it is important, too. And I think that I'm wondering how this stuff is going to get enforced. Like, what evidence are true? That's, that's always the major issue, right? Like, who, yeah, who, who's like, going to get out there, and it? how are you going to do it? Is a park ranger going to come over and be like, "Are you killing bumblebees? Like, what's how's this? Yeah, how's this going to work?" So, I think that's where my question is. I mean, they could give them all the protections in the world, but is anything going to be enforced? Yeah, that's the big question. Well, um, yeah. cause everything takes money and we don't have a beat police right now. So, right. And I know, unfortunately, even at the state level, I'm a, I'm a little sad because there was a be safe program, um, that the state, U uh, the, uh, CDFA was enacting that was going to be able to help beekeepers communicate with farmers and be able to tell them like, Hey, we're spraying here. Can you please give all beekeepers notice before you need to spray pesticides on this field? I think it's like within a mile or two radius. And a lot of these programs that were being built and enacted are now going away, like in their infancy. And ah. un it's unfortunate. Not all the laws I would agree on necessarily, especially like, uh, like some places, definitely getting into the weeds here, but about like, uh, I know some counties now only want people to keep European bees, like which means you need to buy them from a commercial seller. Um, and that's, you know, the concern about keeping Africanized bees, which is pretty much any wild bee uh, in California. Southern California has been hybridized at this point with Africanized genetics. Um, you know, concern is safety. Um, but at the same time, I'm like, okay, Again, enforcement, it's really making it. And the classifications I saw, like, how do you prove that it's this bee is a wild Africanized bee and not a European one? And I looked at some of the, um, like, the guidelines for that, like how they test that, and it didn't quite make sense to me. Um, like, it's like, oh, if the bees bump you a certain number of times, if you're within a certain number of feet, oh, that's, we're deeming that Africanized. I'm like, well, what if, like... Really? That's yeah. stupid. So like, if I so if I run into you, so Kevin, if I run into you and bump into you five times, am I a bee? Like uh, that sounds that's that's pretty dumb. Well, I think the requirement is that you have to be a honeybee in order to be this. To apply to you. But, um, oh, okay. Well, then, then I've never then. met you in person, so this is still <laughs> unlikely but possible. <laughs> now, okay, so enforcement's an issue. Can they can they do enforcement if they? Uh, work on protecting habitat instead. So that that's more of an open space question, if I understand correctly. Yes, um, that's what I'm asking. Yeah, and I think actually California, compared to other states, is actually better at this than most. I think we have the largest percentage of pr protected land versus any other state. Um. And we also have the most biodiversity too. So it's, we're a huge state. We have a lot of biomes and different types of ecosystems here. Um, there's a lot of ground to cover in addition to that. So I think the biggest thing that we are doing these days is we are seeing funding being secured. Um, there's a lot that's going. I'm not sure how much to like the state parks and stuff based on their budgets. I haven't paid attention to that. 
But I do know that even talking in the field to people that there is funding that's starting to go to a lot of like uh, basic land management areas and to public communities, like even parks and stuff. People are taking an interest in this stuff. And I think there is grassroots interest in this as well. And that's that's an important point that you bring up. Like, sure, we have all the, the state parks and the big old national parks, but getting into like local urban areas, how important is just open space or parks, local parks in an urban setting like Los Angeles to make sure that bee populations stabilize and can thrive? I think it's pretty important. I mean, like bees, they they also, there are certain species that are kind of cosmopolitan, like honeybees. They'll go into the wild, but they absolutely love the spaces we provide them too. Our native bees, though, they're kind of everywhere, and some of them are very localized. Um, there are certain bumblebees that only grow within like a single county. If you build wow. uh, a city, you know, in that area, which a lot of places, this is a perfect example, they create a giant L.A., Pasadena, Glendale sprawl. Suddenly everything, every location, whether it's like a tree or if it's a post or stumps that are left there, becomes a target for removal unless someone inspects. Be like, oh, there's like a whole bunch of bumblebees that are protected. Um, there's one in particular. It's got a hilarious name, too, but it is really endangered. It's called Crotch's Bumblebee. Um, <laughs> Named yeah. after Barry, I'm sure. Barry and his crotches. <laughs> and it's like this this bumblebee is like I've done a lot of surveys for it along like the La Crescenta Pasadena um, out to like uh, Silver Lake area. And it's like they, they will like nest in stumps, dead wood uh, near the basin. You really it's really hard to even identify them, even for a lot of wildlife biologists. Like you need to be like an entomologist or a bee expert to really focus on these. And we don't have a lot of people that are specialists or dedicate their careers to one particular species. Um, you know, so I think we're really lacking personnel and knowledge on the ground and in all these urban spaces, there's so much ground to cover. And then you get into the politics of property and people mm-hmm. saying, Oh, I want this to go on here. Like, I mean, there's, oh, a, there's a lot, there's a lot of nimbyism of going on, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, I mean, you'll hear about like a rancher fighting with Southern California Edison over a property issue. And like, you know, all the wildlife is just caught in the middle. Yeah, but well, it makes more sense for us and everybody's mental health if we can figure out how to live symbiotically with nature. Because I always get a big rush when I go out running, and I love to see wildlife, nature, bees, birds, animals, trees, plants, all of it. You know, and I, I think we need to realize that, you know, we're part of the ecosystem too, and we got to be nice to it because we want to see all this stuff still. Well, I think, unfortunately, that kind of comes with just the American mindset. Um, Like, this is a Western European mindset as well, um, where it's kind of like the land is yours to take, the resources on it are yours to use, and it's kind of like the and that's the old, like, Western European type of mentality where we are the kings of our kingdom. And Mm -hmm. America has been more, it kind of has the same mindset, especially even in the early settler days of like, this is the wild frontier and we need to conquer it. And really that's, I mean, look at the size of our cars, the size of our properties, the size of our cities. You know, most of our, on the West coast here, especially LA, we know has been developed laterally. We don't have a ton of skyscrapers um, and we've really built out. I mean, you look at the auto industry as well and, like there, there's a lot of incentive for things to be overdeveloped and for land to be bought up. And it's our mindset, like I said, of where we need we don't have a mindset in America of being harmonious with nature. And and actually, I, I notice a lot of people like they'll agree with you. Yeah, sure. But the moment that it comes between them and their dollar or anything right, really yeah. that they want, people aren't willing to make sacrifices. And I think the best answer is that we need to start an education with that mindset being changed from an early age. And 
I know someone out there is going to say, you want to indoctrinate my kids? And I'm like, no, I, I just want your kids. In the- <laughs> yeah, I just want uh, like the kids in our future generations to appreciate their environment. And, you know, there, there needs to be more field trips outside. There needs to be more naturalists that can actually teach about their local environments. If you know what's in your neighborhood, you're going to respect it a lot more. Do you, do you feel like that's getting easier these days with the the newer like the Gen Zs and and younger millennials they they kind of they kind of get it more? I honestly am not sure. Um, oh, okay. I I don't talk to a ton of Gen, Gen Z. Uh, I like I've got my I've got a younger cousin and he's probably like the best connected I am to the younger generation. Uh, he's probably in his mid twenties now and like. I, I can barely understand the words they're saying these days, like no cop for real. For, I don't, I don't understand it, but the, I'm also like old and I heard a great piece of wisdom that said, like my father said this the other day, uh, it was like, keep older people around you for wisdom, keep people your age around for company and keep younger people around to learn new things. Yeah. That sounds about right. Yeah, and that's uh, why I never learn new things because I don't <laughs> hang around young people. Uh, Barry, Barry is my young person. I don't know any. There I can't teach you anything. You are young at heart, Barry. That's why we have this podcast. We're all learning together. <laughs> so so um, true. But I, I don't. I don't really know. I'd love to hear actually, like from a bunch of Gen Zers, what their thoughts are on the environment. I think I know a little more about their politics than I do about their environmentalism. Um, I think they support it, but is it like, I don't know. Are they too on their is phones? It, yeah. Are is it aware? passive like, support? Is it active support? Are they, are they getting out there and cleaning up beaches or are they just like the platitudes? Like, you know, most of Gen X and the millennials. Yeah. I, my gut tells me that history repeats itself and they're probably yeah. more or less the same as us. Yeah. I'm not sure, though. Well, we'll see. We'll have to have a Gen Z on at some point. We have to find one. Yeah, I, I don't. Do you know any? <laughs> we're we'll gonna have to. One. We're gonna have to get Kevin's cousin on. <laughs> it's the only Gen Z here we know. <laughs> well, Kevin, I get my I get my goddaughter on, but she's like too busy, like graduating high school and going off to college. She doesn't care about us. Well, Kevin, in, in other news, how are the bees doing? How are your local hives doing? <laughs> uh my bees are i mean because we have this bumper crop of rain i've got a bumper crop of honey and it's been it's been amazing can you get a bumper crop of rain oh, God, whatever um sure so- <laughs> sure you just said it we'll, 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 we're gonna allow it that's fine <laughs> yeah sorry i'm looking at some some birds at, at the same time right now there's a scrub jay um anyway so yeah i I, yeah, I see, that's the thing are... about that's the thing about you, Kevin, is when you're hanging out with Kevin and talking to him, a bird will chirp off in the distance, and he's like, "Oh, there's a blue belly, yeah. blue belly." He's like, he's like Carl from Up. <laughs> yeah, that's probably pretty accurate. <laughs> Except he goes, "Squirrel, that is a gray squirrel. That is in the taxonomy," blah, 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 and it gives us all the information about it. See, that's the that's the great thing. It's like Kevin is a a walking. Uh, uh, nature dictionary for us it's fantastic well i got i gotta like keep it in mind too i'm like i want to share so much with people but at the same time it's like people got to be willing and open to learn if you just like throw things at them constantly you know that you got good teachers know when to turn that on and off that's right but we're talking about the birds and the bees so let's focus back on the bees my bees are doing great i just harvested a ton of sage honey from my beehives barry was out there checking it out the week before uh we've got it extracted and bottled so now all my friends and family and people i know that have been waiting for months can are finally getting their jars of honey from me and i'm happy that's great that's great so all this uh rain and el nino you have no problem with huh no this is a good year for me and the bees yeah (laughs) Well, the other arm that you are tackling is mead making, which is amazing to me because I thought that, you know, I never saw honey, honey mead in the wild before. It's never crossed my palate. And then I was at Anderson's the other day, pea soup. You, you know, you taught me all about the art of mead making. And then I saw, you know, they, they make them and sell them at 
up in Solvang. And I was like, holy guacamole, this is a, a product that I've seen not only in Kevin's garage, but now in the real world. So this is a, <laughs> a hugely amazing thing to me. And it's like three ingredients make this cocktail. So what, it, what are you working on now? What is brewing in, uh, in your department? Well, this is kind of exciting. I've got stuff that I'm starting and I've got some stuff that is finishing right now. So what I'm finishing and I can't wait to bottle. I've got about, it's probably about 50 bottles, like uh, wine bottles worth, you know, the 750 of a traditional, um, just water, yeast and honey mead. So this is your traditional standard mead, no bells and whistles or anything like that the way it would have been drank back in the day. And it is made from the honey that I harvested last year. And it has been fermenting and aging for an entire year now. I gave it a test the other day, and I am so excited for this. This is like, I went through a funk during the pandemic, and I kind of, I had a couple batches where I'm like, these are okay, but nothing great. And then I kind of went back to basics, focused on, you know, keeping things sanitized again and really starting all my techniques over and reassessing like, okay, am I doing everything right from the beginning? I kind of fell off there. I went back to my basics, did all of this prep and practice, was really careful with the way I made this, measured everything accurately, uh, documented all the phases of the fermentation. And this came out so good. I'm ready to send these to competition. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what what kind of honey was it? Like clover honey, sage honey? Is it because I'm I'm sure that the taste is different based on what honey kind of honey you use. Absolutely, that's actually a, a good point, and one of the reasons why I love mead more than I love wine because you can get different flavors of wine, you know, from like different grapes. But really, it it kind of has a max and a min there of like where you're going to go. It's all going to taste like grape at the end. Right. Right. <laughs> so honey though is different. Yes. You'll get the sweetness of honey, but there is a different type of honey for every flower that provides nectar. You yeah. can have the most amazing blackberry honey up from Oregon and oh, it'll taste great. like blackberries. Um, you know, uh, on, on the flip side, there's stuff out in the desert, like you can get from like fireweed out in the Mojave or, uh, in Arizona. And this has like a spicy taste, or you can get Tupelo honey from like, uh, down in the South and it almost tastes like butter. It's delicious. Wow. Oh, that would be so good. So, oh, yeah. I'm just imagining that, how smooth that would be. Ooh. Yeah. It's amazing. Ooh. <laughs> okay, so what what were you using? Were you using just like because clover honey is like the honey that everybody buys at the store? What were you using for this for this particular meat? So for this, this is really a wildflower honey from everything where my bees were kept. That's going to be okay. a little bit of buckwheat. You're going to get a little sage. You're going to get a little bit of the uh, the deer weed out there, which is like a local wild alfalfa we have, and really it's going to create this flavor profile of the region where you collected the honey like you hear winos uh like talk about terroir t-e-r-r-o-i-r -R -R, and honey has a terroir as well that's and amazing gonna be, yeah so this is like sagebrush you know chaparral honey uh from the santa monica mountains and it's it's got a great flavor, and it does taste like a couple different things. Sometimes, depending on the batch, you can put your finger on the sage, on something else. And this last year's batch, though, probably had a little more buckwheat. It was late in the season. It's a little more robust, yeah. And it, it's You know what? Though. It probably tastes like Southern California. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, I was going to say the same similar thing there, Joe. Thanks for taking the words out of my mouth. <laughs> Sorry, D. Well, okay, so we've learned a lot here, Kevin. Thanks for being on. And we're going to end today because we were talking about our ages before we started, you know. And, like, I believe that 38 is the year that you're officially supposed to have your midlife crisis. I don't think Joe has had his yet. And he's oh, – Man, I had mine at, like, 25. What are you talking about? Okay, oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm on my third midlife crisis already. That's a, that's a – yeah, that's a quarter-life crisis when you have it in your 20s. 
<laughs> so when do you know? When is go- what is going on over here? Uh, you're talking about me? Yeah, I don't know how to get into uh, it, but <laughs> I was wondering if you're asking him. I'm like, oh, it sounds like he's going through something too. I don't know. No, we um, already <laughs> did, man. It's your turn. No, I was, I, I was actually. This kind of had like a really weird political cross section where I'm like, what's going on here? I was walking up Decker this morning, uh, doing my work surveys, and I I just noticed just how much trash is thrown out on that beautiful stretch of highway. And like 60, 70% of that trash is like alcohol containers. Ah, oh, really? <laughs> Come on, man. Yeah. I mean, so, I, I'm, I'm, I'm the same. I'm like with everybody else. Like I like going up to the mountains and watching a nice sunset. But come on, it's not that hard to pack in, pack out. Well, I mean, the thing that's telling me too, I'm like, there's no parking spot. So this is really like, indicative of how many people are drinking and driving Ugh. um and like I'll, I'll be walking along and i'll be like ah, oh, okay this person had a pacifico and then i'll go to the next one, i'm like ah, oh, flask of popov that's probably some like 21 year old in college in a dorm or something and then the crazy thing was i found like dozens and dozens of bud light cans all the way up and down the canyon <laughs> That's oh man. I hate littering. Why? It's not necessary. I, I, it was like fifty percent of all the trash was Bud Light cans, and I'm like, why? Is this like a political thing? Am I like? I know there's been like the whole Bud Lights canceled thing, and I'm like, who's drinking all these Bud Lights and throwing them in these waterways? What's oh, going man. on? <laughs> so dumb. I'm like, I, 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 I don't know. I'm just like, okay, that's kind of like. Did you turn into the home? crying Native American there, standing on the side of the road, just crying while people were throwing out their trash? Well, it was just like a perfect allegory for like everyone's mad at each other these days. We're all talking about like social issues, which are valid, but then we're completely forgetting the forest through the trees. Pun intended. Mm-hmm. Yep. So what's and, the solution? Yeah. There? I I really do think, going back to what I said earlier, I think it's education. We need to really, like, I want to be a teacher one day. There's a day where I'm not going to be able to keep walking 5, 10, 15 miles through hills a day. I'm going to need to give my knees and back a rest. And I want to be a teacher probably for, like, high school, maybe college. And I, I think that that would be really good. I think we need more people that are, you know, sensitive to the environment and have some empathy for others and animals and you know want to inspire others and i don't think i'm like as far as i've gotten along in life you know people are like oh are you a leader or not and i'm like i'm not sure i'm not i'm a leader but i'm definitely not a follower and i think that there's teachers there's that third group and i really want to be the person that inspires future leaders to be able to care about the things that matter most those are big words man and I agree with them wholeheartedly. <laughs> I think you can do it. I mean, I've never met a teacher younger than me until I met Kevin. Because uh, you teach me every every time I hang out with you, you teach me something, which is not normal. <laughs> so thank you for being so smart. That's why we uh, have you on the show, man. Well, I appreciate it. You know, be a student of life. Uh, you know, ask questions and be curious and, uh, you know, g- get out there. There's It's a big world. Okay, so as we leave the podcast today, why don't you teach us something there, Hotshot? You spoke a lot of spoke, so why don't you tell us something that we don't know yet? Go ahead and leave us on a big note. Come on. All right, we'll talk about bees. Did you know that a single honeybee in its lifetime will harvest about one-eighth of a teaspoon of honey? That's it? That's it, and you can say one... (laughs) <laughs> one beehive can harvest like a hundred pounds of honey in a good year. So think about how many teaspoons, how many bees that is. And it's like, wow, that's a lot of organization. It's mind blowing. <laughs> wow. Yeah. All right, Kevin. Well, thanks for being on. We'll have you back again. If anything crazy happens in nature and, um, good luck finding all of those bird nests and bumming all the construction workers out. 
<laughs> I'll, I'll do my best. Keep, I'll keep them in line. Give me a buzz later. You guys have a good one. Give me a oh, buzz. Thanks, Give me a buzz. I love it.